High school students, you are welcome to join us on Sunday evenings for, uh, for the mix. And we are wrapping up our Proverbs sermon series today, Walking in Wisdom. Uh, we've been covering the book of Proverbs, and we've looked at the topic of friendships. We've looked at the, the subject of being wise with our words, having wisdom for marriage and parenting and finances and our work. And today, we look at what it means to maintain this wisdom for life. What does it look like to maintain this wisdom for life? So I know you all have sat because you already stood, but I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we read Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, all together. This is where Proverbs finds its purpose and its meaning. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for learning wisdom and discipline, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving prudent instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. Let a wise person listen and increase learning, and let a discerning person obtain guidance. For understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Let's read that verse right there one more time. It's the crux of the whole message right here. We read all seven verses, but it's verse seven I want to draw our attention to. Let's read it again together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. This is the word of the Lord. The people say, thanks be to God. Let this word fill our minds, flow from our mouths, and free our hearts to live as the beloved children of God. You all can take your seats. Some of you already have. Wait, wait, amen. But he's done reading the scripture, so I can sit down now. Uh, if you are taking notes this morning, the title of the message is Wisdom for Life. Wisdom for Life. And what I love about these first seven verses of the book of Proverbs is that it reminds us that it's instruction that is not just for the young, for the inexperienced, for the immature, but that this book of wisdom is for everyone, including those who are mature, those who are experienced, those who are seasoned. Uh, those who are already wise, this book is for each and every one of us to remind us of what it says in verse 7, that if we're going to maintain this wisdom, we need to understand the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. I don't see anyone excited about the fear of the Lord. Like, man, I thought wisdom was going to begin with something a little bit more exciting. What do you mean the fear of the Lord? Because I remember reading, you know, the book of Proverbs and getting right to that one and being like, oh, my goodness, I got to be afraid of God, right? And it is this fear of the Lord, this misunderstanding in particular about what it is to fear the Lord that causes people to drift away from God for one reason or another. That phrase, the fear of the Lord, is mentioned 10 times in the book of Proverbs, and its misunderstanding arises from a theological context and a relational context that we really have kind of built into the relationship or projected from the relationship perhaps with uh, a parent. How many of you grew up in a home where some parent says, after you did something you wasn't supposed to do, you wait till... Or somebody might have said, you wait till your mama get home. You just, forget about daddy. Wait till your mama get home. Wait till your grandma finds out. Huh? And, and, and what would it cause you to feel? Fear. Fear, right? Some people would even say, you know, if you're raised, you got to put the fear of God in them. You know, you got to put the fear of God in them. And this fear of God, this misunderstanding, there are several shades of misunderstanding, but let's talk about a few. There's a misunderstanding about what it means to, be, uh, uh, to have this fear of the Lord 
as terror, fear as terror. That you are terrified, uh, you know, in relationship to God. Some people think fearing the Lord means to be terrified of God, expecting that the Lord is going to punish them or harm them. For living uh, in this relational way with God where we are afraid of God causes all kinds of anxiety. It doesn't build the kind of closeness that God desires to truly have with us, but it, it brings about this fear of displeasing God. Uh, you, you go to the carnival or you go to the fair, and, and one of those, those famous games is the whack-a-mole, right? It pops up, and then wham, you try to you knock that bad boy right on down. And we kind of feel our relationship like with God when we're terrified of God, that we pop up, and if we pop up in the wrong place, God is going to smack us down. We're afraid. Or we misinterpret the fear of the Lord as a fear of obligation, that we are, we are serving God uh, out of obligation, That we've got to do it. Once you become a follower of Jesus, you are obligated to follow through on all of the Lord's commands. And if you miss one of those commands, then there will be consequences to pay. And so you heard about there being a relationship with God, but this fear of the Lord produces this obedience out of obligation, not an obedience out of delight or out of love. And then some of us look at the fear of the Lord as a fear of control. That fear has actually been used to control and manipulate behaviors. It has been used to control and manipulate actions. Used to control and and manipulate uh, an outcome. And some of us see that a relationship with God that is based out of fear of one where God is just trying to control us trying to make us do what God wants us to do. And when we have this view of the the Lord, particularly the fear of the Lord, it produces not only anxiety but distance in our relationship with God. Not one that is built out of trust or love or admiration, but one where we just don't want to tick God off. Don't do something that'll mess up, you know, God. Don't do something that'll make God angry and make God angry with you. Leave that alone so it causes us to have some real distance with God. Uh, Particularly when we look at Christianity in America uh, over the last uh, hundred years, this fear of the Lord was used as a tool to get people to accept and receive Jesus Christ as their own. Anybody ever been through some of the evangelism training where they they taught you the phrase when you go out and talk to someone on the street or or someone at work? uh, If you were to die today, if you were to just poof, be gone, where would you end up tomorrow? And then you get somebody to say, in the ground. I mean, like, where what? Where am I? I'm just going to be in the ground, I guess, in a casket, you know what I mean? But it was used as this tool to manipulate and to bring fear into the heart of the person they're trying to win to Christ. Where would you be? And when there was a fear of hell, when there was a fear of being separated from God, perhaps that was a tool to convince people to accept a relationship with God. But we're not in that day today. Maybe that worked in the past, but if you're trying to win people to Jesus now, if you're trying to win people into the kingdom of God, I I doubt very, very much so that if you went to someone and said, Brandon, where are you going to be tomorrow? Where are you going to be tomorrow should your life be taken away from you? Because people don't really have that kind of fear of the Lord like they used to. Where, where, it cause, and that, where it caused them to be afraid of being apart or away from God. And perhaps for, that's a good thing, right? We're not supposed to be afraid of God by, by being so close to God that God is going to take us out. But beloved, if we look at this thing as a spectrum, that uh, a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of the fear of the Lord on one end produces this kind of 
fear as terror and obligation and control. On the other side of the spectrum, Joel and Amy, is a familiarity with God. See, on one end of the spectrum, you could be so uh, afraid of God that it causes you to tense up and have some anxiety. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can become so familiar with God that you treat your relationship with God quite casually. To have this kind of familiarity with God is to lose a, a reverence of who God is. It is to treat God's wisdom lightly as something that is just a a mere suggestion, not something that you should actually follow. And it diminishes God's authority in your life. And so when some people are saying, hey, listen, I grew up in that church. I grew up in that, you know, community. I grew up in that home. I grew up in that tradition where it was all fear-based and you got to do this and the rules and the this. And if you don't, then you know you're going to be messing up and you're going to lose your salvation. And you rejected that. And you went all the way over to the familiarity piece with God where, uh, you know, your actions don't really have any consequences at all. We rely so heavily on the grace of God. We know that God is gracious. We know that God is kind. We know that God is loving. We know that we can make a mistake and it's not going to break our relationship with God. And so it causes us to be so familiar with God that we are just kind of flippant with our actions and our behaviors. There's there's no real big consequence. I mean, I know I'm going to heaven. He died for my sins. So when I sin, he died for that. When I mess up, he died for that. When I do wrong, he died for that. So why am I going to stress over messing up? Why am I stressing over, you know, some sin? I mean, like, get your stuff together. Get your act. Jesus already died for that, so you good, bruh. Going to do it again and again and again and again. Being too familiar with God is losing a reverence for God, treating God too casually, and it can lead to these spiritual dangers. It is spiritually dangerous when we become so familiar with God that we lose that God is God and we are not. When we lose this reverence, we lose the awe, we lose the accompanying relationship that comes from treating God as awesome and amazing, not just ordinary or common and the consequence of that is that it, it, it diminishes our worship. We, I, I've had so many conversations with some folk who, who come, you know, into worship or they look at their relationship with God and they just say, man, I just don't feel it. And I'm wondering, like, what's going on there? Have you become so familiar with God that you're not impressed with just waking up in the morning? When you walk outside, you're not impressed with what the weather is doing, as if you created the weather. You look at the weather report and say, oh, it's raining today, or oh, it's too hot today. I'm going to have a miserable day. And you forget who created the day, who made the day, who caused the earth to spin and the stars to shine and the weather to do its thing, all to give glory and honor to God. We've lost a reverence for who God is when we treat God familiar. But when we treat God's wisdom lightly, that over-familiarity can create a, a casual approach to God's commands. I mean, one of the beautiful things about reading the Gospels is seeing how Jesus interacts with the people of his day. And particularly when he looks and he walks and worships with his disciples, he says, listen, y'all, listen, listen. I don't call y'all servants. I don't call y'all the kind of people who who don't get the information, the people who who have uh, secrets kept from them. No, no, Bobby, he says, I call you friend because everything my father has shared with me, I shared with you. And we read the Gospels and we see how Jesus is so friendly, so approachable. And then we get to that stage of life in our Christian experience in in, in America where we buy the t-shirt that says, Jesus is my homeboy. That's my homeboy right there. That's my ace boom coon. That's my dog from down the street. You know, what I'm saying? that's my ride or die right there. You know, what I'm saying? we create such a familiarity with God that we treat God so casually that when God speaks to us, 
we question whether or not we need to obey it. Do I really need to, do I really need to follow this? I mean, like, should I really pay attention to what God is saying here? Isn't it just a mere suggestion to be obedient, to have integrity? It really can't be that bad. And all the while, the greatest spiritual danger here in treating God so familiar is that we diminish God's authority in our lives, and we lack submission to the way and will of God. So what's the correct view of the fear of the Lord, Pastor Rich? I'm glad you asked. The fear of the Lord is not about being scared of God, nor is it about treating God with such familiarity that we lose our sense of reverence and awe. The term fear the Lord, it appears 10 times in the book of Proverbs, and it is a Hebrew word, yara, that has a range of meaning. It does mean to be afraid. That is one of the meanings. In Genesis chapter 3, 10, Adam responds with fear when God calls his name, but that fear was based off of his sin and being found out of his sin. But it also means to be in awe. Particularly in 1 Kings, it speaks about the king who was being crowned and coronated, and it created this this awe for the children of Israel, this awe in this arena, this awe in relationship that, wow, God's presence is here with us. It was incredible. And then lastly, its meaning is to have respect. There in Leviticus 19 and 3, it specifically, yes, I'm looking at you young people, it talks about having respect for your parents. And so it has all of this shade of meaning when we use that word, the fear of the Lord. But the Hebrew theologians and scholars says that this was not to produce the kind of fear where we are trembling in our bones. Do you know the most repeated command throughout the Bible is do not fear? That is the most often command that is written throughout the, from the Old Testament to the New. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. When the angels showed up, the angels would say to the human beings, do not be afraid. When God's presence would show up in the place and people would respond in trembling and in fear, believing that they were going to be consumed, the Spirit would say, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Because this kind of yara is supposed to produce a spirit of transformation. It is supposed to put us in a posture where we surrender ourselves to the glorious majesty of God. Howard Thurman, a prominent theologian and mystic, often emphasized the importance of our inner spiritual experience in reverence for God. That there was something that was happening out here that was supposed to move us inside. He understood the fear of the Lord as a profound respect and awe that leads to wisdom. If we want to gain wisdom, we we develop a sense of awe of God because it aligns us with God's divine will. And here's what he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because it roots our being in the holiness of God, which transforms our values and our actions. When you want to change your behavior, We want to change your habits. What Thurman is saying is surrender and give yourself to the glorious majesty of God. Worship God. Uh, I am not, this is a cat, I am not a Harry Potter fan. I know. I have not read one book. I watched all the movies until the the last two when they broke it up and they were just trying to make money. That's what it was. They drew that thing all the way out. But in the Harry Potter series, there is this guy named Dumbledore. And Dumbledore commands this deep respect and reverence both from students and faculty at Hogwarts. I got to read this because I don't have it memorized. Despite his kind and very gentle nature, everyone understands Dumbledore's immense power, wisdom, and the role he plays particularly in fighting against evil. They respect him. His presence alone brings a hush into any room, 
even those who opposed Dumbledore acknowledge his authority. What does that have to do with the fear of the Lord? This reverence that was shown to Dumbledore mirrors what it's like to fear the Lord. It is not about fear in the sense of being scared, but of being drawn towards. It is not in rejection of, but it is amazement by, particularly their authority over evil and the wisdom they provide others who are ready to receive it. So just as the characters in Dumbledore's uh, Harry Potter ser uh, sermon series, <laughs> Harry Potter series, this guidance and trust of his decisions mirrors the kind of wisdom we are called to seek for our own lives. That's what fear of God looks like. I love Proverbs 1 and 7 in the message translation. Look at how and listen how it, it sounds. Start with God. Start with God. You want to gain wisdom? Start with God. The first step in learning, though, ooh, this is the part that got me. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. That's how Eugene Peterson is translating that fear of the Lord bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their noses at such wisdom in learning. One more time from the message. Start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their noses at such wisdom and learning. So the question this morning, Chris, Linda, are you ready to bow down and surrender to the Lord? Uh, the the youth at Unite, the conference that we took middle school, I'm sorry, high school students to this past summer, wonderful experience, um, and they introduced this devotion, this devotional called the 21 Day, 21 Day Journey, is that the name of it? A little book, yeah, 20, what? what? Rhythms. Rhythms, thank you, but it was a 20-day thing, thank you, y'all was paying attention, it was a test, it was a test, you passed the test, Cora, you passed the test. I did it with them, but I didn't do it very well. Uh, it had... It had these recommendations for you to, to develop a, a new rhythm in your relationship with God. One of them was to recite the, uh, Psalm 23, recite Psalm 23 uh, throughout the day. Pray three times a day. Walk outside for 15 minutes. Limit your social media intake to 15 minutes a day. Uh, journal and, and write, you know, thank yous and so forth to different people. Uh, you know, they give you a little activity each day. And, and we would check in. We had a little group text. We had a group chat going on. How you doing today? What's going on? How's it going, Lily? Is it cool? You know, great. You know, awesome. Uh, anybody got any struggles going on? You struggling with this or whatever? And, of course, the pastor's in it, so I'm obviously killing all of the exercises, right? But the one that was most challenging for me was actually they asked you to, when you pray, is to pray on your knees. Get down on your knees and pray. Now, I grew up, y'all know, I grew up in a Christian home, okay? Grew up in a Christian home. Dad was a pastor. When, when we went to bed, we said the Lord's Prayer at the end of the bed. Everybody in the family got down on their knees, and we said the Lord's Prayer. So this built a habit of getting down on my knees to pray, right? But as I got older, I realized I don't got to get down on my knees to pray. I can pray right here in this bed. I can pray in this car. I can pray walking around. And I got so familiar with God to get down on my knees. It's like, I ain't got to do all that. It does not take all of that to pray. And so when the 21-day thing said to pray on your knees, I was like, they just trying to do some manipulative thing over here. And I'm, me and God, we cool. God know. God knows I don't need to get down. One knee or two knees, with left knee or right knee. It don't see, Lord, you ain't even tripping on that. So I ain't even. But when I started, when I tried, I realized the issue was not getting down on my knees. The issue was that I really didn't want to surrender to the Lord. The issue was that I really didn't want to give it all over to God. 
The issue was that I thought I was God and God was Richard, you know what I'm saying? That, that God was supposed to listen to what I said. God, God the, only, the only reason I'm praying to you anyway is to ask you to bless what I've already made up my mind to do. So God, will you go on ahead and bless what I have already made up in my mind to do? And if the Lord says no, I am asking you to surrender yourself, to get down on your knees and to surrender everything. Surrender the outcome. Surrender the process. Surrender the plan. It all belongs to me and to me alone. And what it is supposed to produce, beloved, is a trust in God. That, God, I am down on my knees because I trust you. And, Lord, if that's not far enough, I'll get down all the way on my chest and lay prostrate out for whatever it takes, Lord, for you to know that I love you, I trust you, I'm dependent on you. There is nobody but you who can make a way for me, my family, my job, my community, my house, my future. God, it is all yours. I lay out here, God, to demonstrate that I surrender all to you. I surrender all to you. I'll even get down in my all white pants and shirt <laughs> on this stage. So there are benefits, beloved, to fearing the Lord. Here they are real quickly, three, three benefits. Number one, we recognize the voice of God. Number two, we live with fewer regrets. And number three, we develop a healthy connection with God. These are the benefits that come from Fearing God in the way that the Hebrews describe, that it is supposed to be, like the worship team saying, a refining fire. The benefits of fearing God is that we learn to recognize what God's voice sounds like and that we live with fewer regrets. And when we look back on our lives, we're not filled with regret. We're not filled with despair. We're, we're not haunted by the mistakes of the past and that we develop this healthy, strong connection with God, one that is not based out of fear. I'm not afraid of God, but one also where I'm not so familiar with God that I'm treating our relationships so casually, one that is right as Proverbs describes. So, Lord, would you help us to make our aim to follow your wisdom to teach others your ways. Lord, would you help us to choose actions that honor you and love others? Would you deepen in our relationship and walk with you to love you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? Because that is what we were made for. Throughout this sermon series, we said that wisdom from Proverbs is not a promise, but a principle. And this principle right here is one that will lead to the promise of a secure relationship with God. When you apply this principle consistently over time to develop that awe of the Lord, the promise is that you will develop greater security in your relationship with God and for your choices from one day to the next. It's no coincidence that we're ending this Proverbs sermon series on this first Sunday of the month where we receive communion. Wisdom, Solomon says, begins with the fear of the Lord, and communion reminds us to begin with God, to start with God. Start your spiritual life with God. Start your decision-making with God. Start your life every day with God. And if you are not a follower of Jesus, we invite you to start your life with God today. Start your life with God. Start your life with the Lord who knows all and sees all and desires the very, very best for you. You don't have to be afraid of God. God's not trying to control you. God has wisdom and guidance for you that will lead to a, a thriving and flourishing life. Doesn't mean that you won't incur any hardships or challenges. In fact, you will encourage uh, or incur hardship and challenge. But the promise is that God will always be with you and God's community will always surround you. So if you haven't received your communion cup today, we have a, 
Our ushers here ready to provide that for you. And we do have an open table. We assume that if you are taking this communion, the the bread, which is the body of Jesus, the cup, which is the blood of Jesus, then you are being drawn closer to the Lord. You are being drawn closer to Jesus. Maybe you haven't made up your mind yet. But there's this story, this passage in the Bible where Jesus was literally, after his resurrection from the dead, walking with two folks who were on a walk on a road called Emmaus, and they didn't even recognize who Jesus was. It wasn't until he entered into their home and he broke bread that their eyes were then open to who Jesus really was. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed and had become the custom for the early church, he took bread, that's that little wafer in the top, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat all of it. And in the same way, he took the cup very carefully because he was wearing white that day. I'm convinced of it. He said, this, this is my blood shed for you. He says, this is, as often as you eat this and you drink this, you remember me until I come again. Take and drink all of it. Would you pray with me? Lord, our desire that you put in our hearts is to follow you. That desire didn't even come from ourselves. Lord, it came from you. So we pray that you be with us for every decision, Lord, every relationship, every trial and every success, every victory and every defeat, that we have the wisdom that you can provide for our flourishing until you come again to rescue us. In Jesus we do pray. Amen.